Live and Learn. Welcome to Season 2 of our weekly conversations about living, learning, teaching and intercultural communication. We discuss cultural awareness and diversity, education and mentality, and we never really know where our talk will bring us in each episode. So, we just follow our curiosity and invite you to join us. In this episode, we share fears of novelty and embracing change, discuss dangers of learning for educators and active learners, talk about planning a course in times of uncertainty, and suggest seeing a bigger picture and applying critical thinking to the educational process. As we know, the best improvisation is well prepared. If we always say, there is so much online, just go and search. But beware, there can be fake information. It's not the topic that you need to be skillful at. It's reasoning and finding the relevant arguments for any discussion is what to master. Again, seeing a bigger picture is much more important than either sticking to the curriculum or being innovative. I was listening to a podcast episode where the linguists were discussing all the words with the root jet or jacked, like project, adjective, and they're all uh, like with the same root and the same uh, and with the same origin. The etymology coming from uh, yakto, jacked, which means throw, and so project. what's your idea? Yeah, project, subject. That's an interesting topic, by the way. A uh, subject, like a school subject, for instance, is something that is thrown under. Reject. Object. Adjective is wonderful here because uh, there the uh, speaker somehow said, uh, oh, I'm not sure what this word has to do with uh, this throwing, but to me it's absolutely clear, honestly. I didn't go and check that, but an adjective is something that is thrown at the side of a noun, standing aside. Or as an adjective is always accompanying a noun, so an adjective is absolutely clear here. Anyway, when we talk about school subjects, um, let's uh, make it so in this new school year, new academic year, that subjects are not just thrown to us that we have to teach, but to somehow reformulate this idea of a school subject as of something that is not just thrown, but being a center of our common interest with the students, like interject, <laughs> I don't know. You know, another thing that uh, comes from here is the subject and object of discussion or subject and object of the um, syntax. So it's not something that is thrown, but something that is connected by the action, by the verb. So you have the subject, the verb, and the object, which is a normal structure of Latin and all after Latin, like the Latin family, um, not only them, but anyway, subject, verb, and object, and therefore like in which relation is subject to the object, right? So this is the thing. So I'm not sure that this is thrown, but more like, um, yeah, making it from the subject which is under, who's on top? The actor is on top, the one who acts. When I was trying to give a little tip to my student how to make the uh, writing and speaking a little bit higher level, I was just trying to say, don't let, let the nouns be bare. Just cover them with the adjective. 
with to with a I don't know with a numeral or sum or you know all of these words they can add up to the adjective and then a couple of classes or I don't know next class she says oh yeah you re I remember you didn't want me to use nude nouns <laughs> oh so nice that's how from a bear now. <laughs> We have now a, a, a funny, you know, meme in our relationship. So, like, whenever she says, ah, yeah, so this is just, like, nude now. We are already in the school year thinking how to organize uh, the workflow, the study flow, the teaching flow. Has uh, there been uh, much that uh, has changed since the beginning of uh, this new unusual school year? I think our teaching and our work in the universities, in my case, or with the uh, tutorials or with uh, the, um, tell me, the students privately, what you're saying, has changed to the extent when the world right now is like a global simulator for resilience <laughs> where nobody knows what's going to be there so as i was planning all the august through the lectures the slides the logistics of the way i want to teach this or that lecturing course I always had in mind that I have no idea if this particular lecture will be online or offline. So I had to orchestrate, to structure the lecture in this way that it is still interactive. So it has the elements which I can use in class when I'm in presence and I can give some interaction or ask for interaction or offline and that they are visually appealing of course because i need to work with the attention span and the first year students are known for being very easily distracted and not having the big picture in their mind of what are they exactly doing here and how this particular subject is their core study line or something so I guess what has changed is that what we have prepared is not necessarily what will happen in the class or not necessarily, so it will be improvisation. And as we know, the best improvisation is well prepared. And in this case, <laughs> we don't know what to be prepared for. I know that one of my colleagues, yesterday we had a talk with her, she teaches uh, Japanese culture in the National University, and she said that uh, they uh, have to give the biggest number of the lectures within the first two, three weeks online, which means like bumping a lot of theoretical information, a lot of a span of the years of the uh, writers of the books that is semester wide. So basically, the students will not have the time to read those because it's like a lecture every day. And then it will be extremely difficult to read like 300 pages book or I don't know. And this is not the only subject, right, for, for the students. So how they are going to keep up it's a question that we were discussing. So uh, why are they doing that? Is that because they are not sure what happens later? So they want to give us uh, much uh, information early in the term. That was the decision of the management to make all the lectures within the first two, three weeks. However, in my understanding, the lecture would be much easier to give online to the people, to like a vast number of the teachers who haven't been teaching online before, a lecture is easier to get. But the interaction, the practical, the seminars, the colloquials for a majority of teachers who are not digitally trained or equipped, it would be way more difficult. So I, I, I cannot see the reason behind it. 
In one of our previous episodes, we mentioned uh, seeing a bigger picture. And um, we spoke about how important it is to be uh, resilient and to be able to act in stressful situations. We said that seeing a bigger picture is uh, important. Seeing the purpose is more important than being concentrated on the process. In your example, what I see is the opposite. The university management is much more focused on how they are going to organize things uh, to run, forgetting about the bigger picture, forgetting about being student-centered, as if they were thinking that uh, it is more difficult for the teachers to be... um, digitally trained and to deliver lessons in different ways, seminars, webinars, lectures. I imagine that here the the university management is much more uh, focused on uh, their side and not on the side of the students who are actually the clients in this situation. And uh, how am I going to be more concentrated on uh, my own convenience and not on the convenience of my clients in the education process. To me, this does not sound convincing as uh, a choice. I would rather invest into teaching lectures how to be involved in this digital process and not make students read 300 pages a day. That would be uh, my choice if I were... (laughs) in uh, the issues of the university management. Luckily, I'm not. And uh, still just trying to assess what's going on. Uh, I see a problem here and not seeing a bigger picture and not uh, being student-centered. One more thing is as well what you mentioned, the uh, capacity of the um, attention span. How many lectures can you survive through a day if they are lectures only like not seminars not colloquiums not workshops not something practical so you're just sitting and watching some slides and seeing a more or less interesting lecture of course everybody's trying their best but how many lectures per day can you as a young adult can you survive through because like lectures are really packed. They are a distilled set of the notions that it is the very important thing to unpack them, right? So if the st- student says, oh, I just cannot stand the fifth or the sixth lecture per day, and I understand why, I'll just read the slides after. Then what you do, you have a list of uh, periods or a list of events or but the the very biggest idea is to find the connection between them if if we're talking about something like history of literature for example let alone physics and chemistry or something it's like you really need the time to take the uh, knowledge to put it inside right So you need to get used to the concept, to get used to the way it is presented, it is used to what it involved, what it informed. But if the next day you receive another notion with all this information around, and the next day the new one, and then like in five classes you've gone through, I don't know, uh, prehistoric culture to medieval culture, what's, what's the point then? Or, for example, like in two weeks, you have all or half of all the uh, lectures in the subject. I have a question here. I have another question here. Is um, higher education still about lecturing on uh, the amount of topics and about students just getting this information from uh, a lecturer, from slides? Well, that hugely depends where and which particular university, which particular department, which particular teacher. However, from what I heard from this example, 
is that the management of this particular university still sees it as information transmitting. Sounds weird to me now. We started <laughs> discussing the beginning of this new 2020 school year. And uh, let's keep it in mind, it's 2020. It cannot be still about just lecturing and perceiving information, can it? We as well discussed the innovators, early adopters, late adopters and laggards. I saw a fantastic news about uh, an example of this 3% of innovators. I want to share that. Uh, the Indian University created the, uh, their inaugural ceremony uh, when they are giving the diplomas to the students, all in the avatar form in the VR. And uh, they are students who are all invited. And they, they were just like playing this VR game. And uh, they were in, pre in presence in virtual environment when all the teachers and professors were saying their speeches and they were bowing and they were saying the respect and uh, all these thank you words one to another and this was all virtual uh, with the avatars. That's beautiful and uh, so these are innovators who are trying to bring this uh, new tendency into the world of higher education as well and it sounds wonderful i like it what i uh, also like is uh, traditional or classical education if teachers and university management again keep the bigger picture in mind classical education is no bad if you see why you're delivering what you're delivering but if you're just uh, delivering lectures that actually is repeating the same things that students can uh, possibly read uh, on the net or watch on the net uh, using this notion of a flipped classroom, why don't you just announce the topic and let students search for information and then get back to the classroom to discuss or organize activities or do a project together? We have been talking much about collaboration, about uh, networking, about being creative. Why not use all the possibilities if now in the first months you're still in the classroom? Then later go into reading, then later go into more individual stuff. Because this is all embracing change and change is fear and being scared is a normal situation when the new environment comes. But knowing this, it's a very slow process on individual level. That's why the transformation needs the coaches, it needs facilitators, it needs example, it needs leading, leading by example and so on. And what is happening in the corporate industry shows that change is difficult to embrace. Not a lot of people are already on the level when they can say that they are practicing. So it's a practice. It's like everyday conscious awareness that you're practicing change in the new environment. You are prepared only if you are prepared to act in the situation of change. You're prepared if you are ready to react to change. You're prepared if you are ready to improvise. And it does not mean that you are prepared if you've got a prepared text. It's very difficult to put it from the notions to the uh, everyday classroom because when we're trying to grab something new, in the most of the situations, it requires completely new environment, which is obviously out of your comfort zone, but you don't have any, anything that you can hold. And this is almost this physical fear that you don't have this two or three stable points in your for your physical body to feel steady 
And when changes come and everything's coming, new curriculum, online, Zoom, digital, all this. So it's just like spinning wheel, which is under your feet. And it looks like you're just running in a treadmill and you cannot hold. And I imagine this physical fear of not knowing what to do and going to the book to the curriculum, to something that was already written as a anchor to hold, but it's not always uh, the thing that can hold you. It can put you, um, how to say, it can be a sinking stone instead of a, an anchor. And it's again about seeing a bigger picture. If in one of our previous episodes, we recommended teachers to grab this uh, curriculum, for example, and uh, not be too worried having the curriculum already there for you. But at the same time, if the uh, environment asks you to be creative, and innovative, this is something you should be doing, of course. But then again, seeing a bigger picture is much more important than either sticking to the curriculum or being innovative. Seeing what you're doing this for is important at any given time. And then if you're ready to adapt to change, to embrace the change, to see what is actually going on now, and what is needed in this situation? What can you do now? Is it better to stick to the curriculum? Is it better to be innovative? Is it better to have a flipped classroom? Is it better to organize some more creative activities? Depending on what your purpose is and depending on what your students ask for and need. If you can see that, you will be ready for change and uh, you will be adequate in that uh, changing situation. If not, uh, then, yeah, you're trying to grab that uh, rusty anchor and that doesn't help much. And this is, again, we're talking about the very same things of the growth mindsets and fixed, fixed mindset. When we were preparing for the upcoming semester in, in August, all excited and thrilled of what is about to come again are we putting too much of the expectations on our own shoulders this can be a question and again you know this is known very well the the, the uh, better the professional is the more uh, self-doubt comes along with this the more this imposter syndrome comes along with this and you need to have this resource inside or the professional tribe that we were talking about the department the help of the all the collaborators all the stakeholders who are supposed to collaborate together to make it efficient if it is a product oriented Thing where everybody is making their own part and supporting each other. Then when uh, we are getting ready to a new semester, to an upcoming course, to a new topic, to a new subject, to uh, deliver lectures in or to have a course in, and uh, we Google something just for general information and uh, come across so much advice and so many resources as uh, eight strategies to improve participation in your virtual classroom, 10 ways to keep your students active uh, during an online lesson, 48 new ways of delivering material in a lecture on Zoom. When we come across this uh, advice, these recommendations, uh, how do we choose what is um, to be accepted, to be adapted for our classroom? What should uh, rule us in this search? Because there is a whole ocean of resources of different sorts. And then uh, 
okay, you can just take one resource that you most trust. Okay, that could be one option. Or you could get lost in this uh, vast choice. Or what else could you do? If not, again, see a bigger picture and think why you need to be using those 8, 10, 48 different strategies, ways, uh, tips. Maybe you just need uh, one strategy or one tip. It's uh, like we also mentioned, when you travel or when you move countries, what you take with you is you. When you come into the classroom, what you bring to your students is you. In the end of the day, this is the most valuable resource that you can share. Everything else is on the internet. Students can easily find any of those strategies and tips online, free access. But what they cannot probably get access to so easily is the personality of a teacher. And then what you bring to your students is you in the sense that you've already read much you've already tried to adapt some of these strategies to the classroom last year with a different situation and now you're bringing all of this again but processed differently because you've embraced change maybe hopefully and you come into the classroom and here you are and uh, here is your collaboration with the students and when i uh, say you come into the classroom, I don't mean you physically enter the classroom. I also mean you turn your computer on. I also mean you send uh, some materials to your students in whatever way uh, you teach. Such empowering ideas, yeah. Like you mentioned, the more experienced the teacher is, the more there is this imposter syndrome. But uh, like why? With every step you make, you get more and more experienced. And this is what is most valuable, isn't it? Your phrase about every step you take uh, brought me to thinking of a beautiful example that I was I was yesterday preparing for the um, bringing the blue ocean strategy to the class of the business communication to the students. And I was going through the videos of Rene Margon, who is uh, the um, professor of strategy, change strategy in INSEAD, the top business school in the world. And what she said that, as I mentioned previously, that in the corporate people are scared to change but also they are the first one because they can pay for the coaches who can help them to change and she gave the example of of a mother on a beach side with a kid who is scared to swim she said a lot of people get their kids scared by this boat where they take you on the boat and just throw you to the ocean so that you swim. And then you definitely will swim. But because there is this almost existential threat, uh, the mothers are scared of the kids going to the seaside for the first time. The fathers are scared. Uh, grandparents are most scared in this case. But it's really interesting how she showed like is your kid really scared because you can just come and say oh do you want to touch the water with your toes do you want to feel how it feels do you want is it cold is it hot is it warm is it nice do you like to go barefoot and like, it's okay, I'm here, I'm holding you by the hand, I'm doing this with you. And when you're stopping with your kid uh, bare feet to the sea line, and you're showing the example, you're asking how the person, the kid feels, all this, you know, physical feelings almost. And then, like, it's okay, we can go back if you don't like. And there was so much 
of the power in, in her words that as the coaches, as the teachers, as the providers of this change, it's important to be there step by step. And then like the second time you come to the to the sea line and then you're going like what knee lands maybe. And then you're talking and <laughs> you see that the kid is already swimming, diving, going all, all the way through. And now it is your responsibility to see that it is not overwhelming, right? So the, it, he or she knows that like you don't need to dive with your like and breathe in the same time, right? So you need to make sure that the skills are there already. But this very curiosity of a kid like, oh, wow, what what is this? How does it feel? It's important to do this little baby steps instead of just throwing everybody from the boat and see if we can swim or not. So that, that was such a beautiful me- metaphor that I want, again, to say this was René Marigoni. Just try to see this is the one of the top world experts on change management who is trying to show that we are all on the same very level of being scared of something that we've never tried yet. Then if we are curious, the fears step aside because if a toddler is curious to feel what this water is like, they will definitely go into water and nobody and nothing can stop them because it's the curiosity that leads them. Then everybody else with their fears, like parents and grandparents, can be there with their fears, but the actor is the one who's most curious and who's trying things out for the first time. To support this curiosity is really important for educators, for parents, for caregivers, and uh, not uh, imposing your fears on uh, a toddler who hasn't got them yet. Yeah, there are dangerous things. When it comes to teaching, there are no dangerous things. Like for a student, what, uh, what dangers are there if a person is curious to get to know more? Okay, that's a good that's a good question. What are the dangers for the students? I think mis um, interpreting something that is boring for not interesting. I think that's one of the biggest dangers of the teaching and of the learning. Like when you say ah no, it's boring. Mm. So I think this is one of the threats that can be can have a huge impact the second threat is favoring the the scare to try out oh don't oh don't do this oh don't do that it's never an actor of learning it's um, usually someone stay uh, standing aside accompanying maybe leading but it's never an actor themselves. If um, it's your curiosity that made you choose this course, you would never say it's not interesting. You would probably or you could find uh, something boring in the process. Then there is something wrong in the process, I believe. But if you chose this course, It's not you as an actor of learning to say it's not interesting. And it's never you as an actor of learning to say that uh, you shouldn't do something. So these are, let's say, dangers by now, those that you mentioned, are the dangers that I see are imposed by other stakeholders, as we now say and never are brought by uh, the one who seeks knowledge. Live and learn. Other dangers we might be thinking about are fake information. If we always say, there is so much online, just go and search. But beware, there can be fake information. It makes me think of organizing the course 
so that a teacher does not just deliver information that can be found, but teaches students how to distinguish between what is um, fake and what can be trusted as a source of information? That's a big question because when we're trying to say, okay, go uh, to the, uh, I don't know, to the LinkedIn and find 10 examples of how the pastel analysis is brought by the companies. In this case, you might be a little bit on the safe side because that is a professional network and it's interesting to see how different companies doing the same framework or applying the same framework. But when we're talking about, uh, for example, the uh, lower grade or uh, lower age of students or lower level of abstract things, I heard in a webinar the phrase something like go to Twitter on these hashtags and scan the 10 uh, tweets and tell me what you think. Well, I tried this and I can say that a lot of the tweets are very far from being educative, appropriate, relevant, and a lot of them contain, if not graphic images sometimes, but uh, some kind of inappropriate information even if this is like a normal hashtag, like nothing in the concept is, is, is dangerous. But that, that is, a, again, where do the uh, kid, kids or students or learners get their information? Because you can say, okay, Google the, uh, I don't know, the past analysis. But past is something that if you, if you go to the images, that's the insects and you, you you can try and see a lot of the uh, you know graphic things of you know killing insects and so on at the level when you're a student at university you can see see the difference but again how this information is related so this is this critical thinking that we should again step by step pre-C so I normally, uh, when I do the worksheet for, for example, for the home task, so I'm, I'm writing, getting ready for the topic, blah, blah, blah. So for example, this blue ocean theory, pastel analysis. I'm just saying in this video, then put the link, see how, like who is, for example, Renee Marigo and blah, blah, blah. What is she saying about that thing? One, two, three, four. So the person needs to, listen to a longer piece of video and try some key uh, concepts. And then what are the questions that she asks everybody to ask themselves? What would be your answer? What, what is the question to the economic student that she asks? What would be your answer? And uh, further listening or further video, just watch a longer piece without any questions. But I say... What, what I did yesterday is uh, try to draw your own mind map of the concepts and keywords that were used in this longer piece. And then the next day, come to my course and we will be trying to see how this approach or how this theory is implemented, what are this or that. But at least you know what to do. You're, you're related to a specific video or two or three or five videos. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that not just Google anything or just to Google, just try to search in the Twitter 10 last I don't know, mentioning of something. The result might be not always the same. If we want to teach students search for information and uh, be critical towards the information they uh, will choose for their further study, analysis, etc. then uh, probably it's a good idea to start with what you propose. So first you lead them, and then you propose them to do this search work and explain why they chose this material, why they trust this source, 
then step by step develop this individual uh, independent scale for critical thinking while looking for information. The further thing would be, this is something that I really love doing is already when, okay, when I'm considering this course or where, when I'm thinking of this, I have no idea what is the, what are the competence of the students. I haven't seen them yet. Uh, that's the first year student. So I have no idea what is their uh, critical thinking, analytical thinking. Are they aware of like how to get the concepts, how to distribute the concepts and so on. So I, I don't know. I cannot expect everybody to be on the same level. So that's what I do, what I do. But the next step will be, of course, uh, just uh, doing the podcast uh, episodes, lists, or what I love doing is just searching for case studies in LinkedIn and then making the uh, LinkedIn post with the introduction what the information will be there. So then summarizing the, uh, I don't know, case study by Unilever, case study by by another company, by Facebook, they are all very generous about their information. And then you can make a post of like seven, ten, five, eight case studies where the students write their own, I don't know, summary, why they chose the specific ones, and then the conclusion. In this case, that would be already a digital thing, that would be already a uh, summative uh, information, right? But also, as you were saying, the critical uh, thinking, because even if you Google through the podcasts, right, through the... Um, the platform that you are using for author speaks, right? So there are, what, 10, 15 million episodes already in one platform? If you Google, how many, like, millions of episodes? Whatever you Google, even if you Google, I don't know, gross mindset. You need to be able to choose, to analyze the information, to... Argument, justify, exemplify... Then if we get back to classical education, what we now call interaction in the classroom, were the first ancient Greek dialogues. Guys, seriously, it's nothing innovative. <laughs> it's just how people learn through communication and uh, reasoning and leading a dialogue and criticizing and arguing and coming to a common conclusion. And in general, you call it just thinking and speech. As simple as that. We just need to remember that and apply it in a modern classroom as well. Yeah, as they were saying, so it's, it, it's not the topic that you need to be skillful at. It's reasoning and finding the relevant arguments for any discussion is what to master. And so what are we um, trying to invent here when we talk about the strategies to improve participation, to organize communication and interaction in the classroom? Let's see the bigger picture. <laughs> Curious about what we discuss next? Please subscribe to Live and Learn podcast and join our community on social networks. Live and learn.